Right, I think I'm talking and everything. So, uh, hi, uh, my name is Sanki Lee from uh, PHOD. My talk today, the title is What Caused the Summer Retreat? And wait a second. I had to record it. I had to check my time. Uh, the treat, uh, summer retreat and winter expansion of the Antarctic sea ice in the Amundsen and Bering Sea since 1979. Uh, and uh, my collaborator include Jose Lopez, Ugun Chang, Dennis Volkov and Yan Yun Liu and Rick Wanakov. Uh, so the title is pretty pretty long. It was it was not that long before I uh, put this this two Beringa Sin and Amundsen Sea there. Uh, so probably you have a question about where this this Beringa Sin Sea and Amundsen Seas are located. So that's in the next slide. So this is the regional seas around Antarctica. So this is the uh, zero longitude line. The west is the west of the this line is uh, West Antarctica, and this is the east side is the East Antarctica here. So this is the so you can see that this is the Chile, Argentina, and this is East Pacific, Central Pacific, Western Pacific, and this whole thing is Indian Ocean, and this is the uh, Atlantic Ocean side. And then the Bering Sea is right here. This is whole thing is Bering Sea, and this is the Amundsen Sea. And this is a Ross Sea, and this is the Weddell Sea over here. And then this whole region, uh, there are many different names for small, small seas here and there, but let's just call them East Antarctic Seas. All right. So this, uh, just a little bit of history. So the Roald Amundsen was the uh, Norwegian explorer who uh, reached the uh, South, South Pole for the first time in 1911. And then this is uh, Fabian uh, von uh, Beringesen. He was an uh, Imperial Russian uh, Navy uh, officer who discovered the uh, Antarctica for the first time in 1820. And then James Weddell was the British sailor and navigator and seal hunter uh, who discovered this area. Now we call it a uh, Weddell Sea. And then Sir James Clark Ross, Ross, Ross was the British uh, naval officer who discovers this area called uh, Ross Sea. So there we have one Norwegian, one uh, Russian, and two British people named after. All right. So before we talk about the Antarctic uh, sea ice, let's talk a little bit about Arctic sea ice. So what I'm showing you here is the linear trend of the Arctic sea ice fraction from 1979 to 2014. So here fraction means if it is zero means no sea ice. If it's 100 percent means all sea ice, no water. So that's what it means. So here you, you see that for the cold season, uh, December to May, you see there is a large reduction of the sea ice fraction of the, um, this is the Barents Sea and also for the um, Otsuka Sea. But if you, of course, this uh, reduction, the retreat of the sea ice is much more, uh, much more strong in the warm season from uh, June to November. Over the Chukchi Sea and the East Siberian Sea and the Laptop Sea and the Kara Sea. So this whole region, you see that the reduction of the sea ice fraction is much more than 40 percent or so. So when we integrate the whole area of the Arctic sea ice, and then uh, plot it as a function of uh, um, this a different season. You see that for 1980s was here for the summer uh, in the September, and then for the uh, 90s was here, uh, 2000 was here, and 2010 was here. So it's accelerating. The trade is accelerating, and maybe 2012 maybe it go, will go here, and 2030 maybe it will go there. Uh, will be like a zero, no ice in the summertime. Here, all, all of the Arctic places. So this is uh, this is observed trend of the Arctic sea ice is consistent, mostly consistent with the signified model prediction uh, for the uh, 21st century, according to this paper by Stroh et al. 2012. And of course, this reduction of the uh, sea ice is due to the increasing radiative heat flux into this region, and uh, but uh, mostly due to the Arctic amplification that uh, a lot of us are familiar with. Okay, so and then when we take a look at the Antarctic sea ice, it's, it's very different. You see a lot of blue. Blue means uh, sea ice fraction is increasing. 
So, uh, so according to uh, the uh, satellite observation, so the uh, uh, Antarctic sea ice has expanded by about 0.5 uh, percent uh, per decade uh, since 1979, which means about 6 percent of increase during the last 30 years or so. So increase is not that much, but so you see that increases all over the places for the warm season, which is December to May, the southern hemisphere. The cold season from June to November, everywhere. But you see Beringhausen Sea, Amundsen Sea, the reduction is very, uh, very high there. So that's for the warm season. But if you take a look at the cold season, it's a different story because it's uh, increasing over here. And if you take a look at the Weddell Sea, it's increasing during the warm season and it's decreasing in the cold season. So it's very complicated. It's a kind of mirror image for, from, for this uh, Eastern Pacific side and then Atlantic side, like this. And then other regions all just uh, increasing all seasons. So the basic, the main question in this study is what caused the seasonally and especially in homogeneous trend of Antarctic uh, sea ice extent since 1979? So that's a question that I'd like to address. So before I get into, before I address that questions, so I want to talk a little bit about this terminology. I think there is a lot of uh, confusion about uh, this different terminology has been used interchangeably and so on and so forth. So I like to make a distinction between the glacier, ice sheet, and uh, sea ice. So ice sheets are basically, it's a big chunk of the uh, ice that is sitting over the bedrock. So there are only two ice sheets. One is in the Antarctica, the whole ice over there and then Greenland. So over the Arctic Ocean, there is no uh, ice sheet there. That's only uh, sea ice. So sea ice, on the other hand, is just really thin, usually like a one meter or two meter at best. And then uh, usually it really um, melt a lot during the summertime and then form during the winter time. So there are large uh, seasonal variation. And then this glacier, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very different. So glacier is basically a big chunk of ice sitting over the, uh, over, the, over the land area. But the distinction between this and then glacier is that the glacier is constantly moving. So for instance, if, they're, if over the mountain, for instance, here in the high rise here in the Antarctica, so it's a very cold here, there is snow falling in all the time. And then this ice will form and form. And due to this own weight and also due to the slope, it will just fall down, crumble and fall down into the ocean, right? So that's, so if it is ice is constantly moving over the land, then we call it glacier. And glacier is responsible for about 60% of the sea level rise during the last 20 or 30 years. The rest is due to the ice sheet melting. Okay. So sea ice does not really contribute too much on the, it actually, it doesn't really contribute at all to the sea level rise. So why do we care about the Antarctic sea ice anyway then? So, but the uh, Antarctic sea ice is very important because it actually controls the surface albedo. So if there is a sea ice, then the uh, short gray radiation coming, and they will be mostly reflected back to the space. So that it has a very a big impact on the radio energy balance of the atmosphere. And also, if there is no sea ice, then the heat will penetrate into the ocean. The ocean get warmed up, and they will create more uh, shallow convection in the atmosphere, and uh, it affects the uh, atmospheric dynamics as well. But for the ocean side, so uh, the sea ice insulate the uh, the underlying ocean from a very cold Antarctic air, which go down to 40 degrees Celsius in summer, or even even worse. So that uh, so the uh, initiate the uh, ocean uh, from the uh, air sea flux of uh, the heat, momentum, and fresh water, and also the column from it. So therefore, this multi-decadal trend could either slow down or speed up the sudden ocean's warming and salinity stratification and also ocean aspiration that is expected. So the potentially this could modulate the sudden ocean's response to the uh, increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's a kind of a basic hypothesis that I like to address in a in a later, not 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 for this study, but the later study. So uh, this is an example of the of the um, um, 
Yeah, this is the, uh, I'll give you an example of this uh, uh, ocean acidification, for instance. This is IPCC projected ocean acidification in the ocean uh, for the 2015 and 2100. Uh, so the, uh, the increased flux of the carbon into the ocean will make the uh, ocean uh, more acid. So um, uh, the one important indices, index of the uh, ocean acidification is called aragonite saturation level. So mm -hmm. this one, if this value is below one, then we call it uh, undersaturated. And uh, if, it is, uh, if it is undersaturated, what happens is that a calcium carbonate will immediately dissolve into the uh, ocean, maybe not immediately. Right, <laughs> it, it will dissolve it. So, for instance, if you if you pull out your teeth and put it in the ocean, if it is uh, undersaturated, it will just dissolve. So, for instance, so so there is a uh, uh, so so that's very important uh, uh, climate change aspect. So, according to IPCC uh, report, this region of the Antarctica will actually be totally undersaturated with that of night. So uh, in the 2100, then there, there is, a, for instance, there is an Antarctic krill, which is very important, vital uh, components of the ecosystem in the Antarctic uh, Sea. So the, uh, these krill will have a hard time maintaining and forming the shell. That could be, uh, have a very uh, bad impact for the ecosystem there. So I think the sea ice is, I think, is important anyway. So there has been a couple of hypotheses. Uh, I will just talk about two main hypotheses here. First, about the wind-driven uh, sea ice drift. So, so this sea ice in the Antarctica, they don't just sit around all the time. They they constantly moving and due to the wind. So there is a, a southern hemisphere westerlies. So they they are constantly moving westward all the time. And very near the Antarctica, there is a, a polar easterly that goes the east direct, uh, that's easterly. So uh, that goes in an uh, opposite direction uh, near the Antarctica. So this is the sea ice draft, uh, drift velocity, a climatological uh, uh, velocity from the satellite image. So what this uh, authors, the Holland de Quark did, was that uh, they uh, computed the co vector correlation between the, the, the sea ice drift velocity and then uh, 10 meter wind at the, at the surface. And then you, they found a very high correlation, especially over this, uh, this region, uh, Ross Sea and Amundsen and uh, Beringa Sea, and also Weddell Sea, and also, uh, you know, entire Atlantic sector. Uh, they found a very good correlation. So the, this is an example, for instance. So they plotted the trend of the sea ice fraction and the ice motion uh, all together here uh, during this 10-year uh, period, 1992 to 2010. So here the color scheme is a little diff uh, is opposite. So it's a, this color here, the red means the sea ice increased, and uh, uh, and then you can see that the increasing sea ice has to is uh, uh, closely linked to the advection of this uh, the sea ice uh, due to the wind here. So this is a 10 meter wind uh, correspond very well here. So this explains uh, this uh, sea ice drift explains the sea ice increase over this region over this region. But uh, the problem is, I, I, I think, uh, but this uh, this hypothesis does not really explain what happened over the uh, Amundsen and Baringa Sea level. Now, second hypothesis uh, is the uh, impact of the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation and the uh, uh, Southern Annular so, Southern Sand. So this is the uh, the IPO, so uh, interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which is the triple SST index of the North North Pacific, uh, Tropical Pacific, and South South Pacific that index. So that regressed onto the sea level pressure here, and also the ice fraction over the for the winter season. So this is JJ uh, cold season JJ ASON. You can see that. This trend of the this uh, not trend. This is this the shape the the pattern of the sea ice increase here, decrease here. Here is very consistent with the the trend that we see from the earlier slide. Um, so so the basic argument is that uh, this uh, the the tropical Pacific could actually create this rusty uh, atmospheric rusty wave that propagate this way, 
and in increase the, uh, this uh, southern hemisphere subpolar so low over the West Antarctica here. But if you actually do the same kind of calculation with the SAM, that is uh, southern angular mode, that you see something very similar. So the, this uh, loading pattern, is, uh, regression pattern is very similar. You see uh, the, the southern hemisphere subpolar so low over the West Antarctica is increased strengthens over here, and also the sea ice, uh, the, the regression also somewhat consistent with uh, the trend that I showed you earlier in the slide. Uh, so the, the recent paper, which came out about uh, like a month ago, really a recent paper by Mir et al., uh, he actually, he and his colleague linked this uh, uh, sea ice trend uh, uh, during the uh, 2000 and 2014 to the recent global warming hiatus, which is links to the negative phase of the IPO. So these things are, uh, I have a question, these things are correlated, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what is the mechanism? Good question. That's the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so the mechanism is like this. So that, uh, so it creates this, uh, you know, it strengthens the subpolar row the low, so it ba basically it brings this cold Antarctic air toward northward. So it's basically the meridional uh, wind is what they are arguing. So it, 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 it should be responsible for very cold air advection over here. In the Antarctica, in the Antarctic Sea, the sensible heat flux is a very important term. Uh, so the cold air over here, like I said, like a, at, the, at the core of it, it's like a minus 100 degree. Celsius, so it's very cold air, advected there, and also in this part there is a warm subtropical air uh, coming toward this region, so that should melt this. That, that's basically a very simple argument that they have, but uh, a problem that I see is that it's, uh, it explains what happened in the winter time, but the summertime we have an absolutely different uh, trend over here, it's melting and you know, uh, the increasing there, so uh, this doesn't seem to work for the uh, summertime. Please. Yeah. But uh, the IPO and the SAM mm -hmm. are basically interdecadal oscillations, so sometimes they're one sign, sometimes they're the other, right? Yeah, I think so. So the SAM is basically like a NAO very similar to NAO, it, it has, is mostly interannual, interannual, it's very high frequency uh, oscillation, but there has been big trend, an increasing trend due There's to the, trend, trend is big, big trend due to the, uh, uh, the um, depletion, depression, ozone depletion, depletion of the stratosphere there, and also the greenhouse gas. Uh, the trend is in the direction of, of the increasing, the yes, yeah. yes, so that will, cool down the stratosphere, stratosphere and then that will actually strengthen the entire jet's but circulation. Excuse me for, um, while we have that up mm -hmm. uh, so what it, what's happening is, is that the, uh, is this extra wind forcing of cold air, is it causing an offshore Ekman drift to increase the area of the ice coverage? This, this hypothesis? Is that what that is? No, this hypothesis is basically sensible heat flux. So here, so this pressure system, because low pressure and high pressure, so due to the uh, pressure gradient and geostropic wind, it will bring more cold Arctic Antarctic air, which is like minus 100 degree in the winter time, bring it over here. So air is much more colder. So there is a very increased uh, sensible heat flux of, uh, uh, you know, cooling there. So that so, that's so what there's, they. There's less melting of the sea ice. Right. So they, they, this is this cycle has nothing to do with the ocean. Just ice <laughs> and the air okay. interaction. There's also a drift, an ice drift associated with those patterns as well. Yeah, there should be. A oh yeah. Should be a Neckman drift. Yeah. This is the this is the sea ice drift. Yeah. That's the that's the another important hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's just, I think if somebody should really explore all these different mechanisms and say, hey, this is responsible for this thing, you know, that thing, things like that. They must Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. So there, so you're right, it's one mechanism explained for a certain thing, the other mechanism explains the other thing. 
like that. But I'm trying to say there is something else. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what about the ocean dynamics here? So this is, this is not sea ice. This, this paper, Cook et al., which came out about uh, two months ago in Nature, this is not a sea ice. This is the, like I showed you earlier, it's a glacier uh, problem. So what they argue was that, uh, oh, this is the Beringer Sea. Beringer Sea, uh, this is the uh, Chile and the Argentina is right there. This is the tip of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. So uh, they look at the, uh, the, the glacier melt over here. Uh, so this red thing here is the, the, the area there is uh, in a glacier melting is happening over here a lot. And then uh, so uh, what they look at was that they actually look at the temperature, ocean temperature over here and over here, over here. So for this side, they have the uh, bunch of uh, profile measurement uh, for the 1990s that was like this. And then uh, for the 2000, it kind of changed a lot. So it kind of warmed up. So temperature goes the increase this way. So it increased a lot over here, especially in the 100 meter to 200, 300 meter like that. Uh, temperature has increased a lot. And for the uh, this uh, different region also, uh, South SW here also increased a lot over here. So what they, so it also kind of a move up also. So what they argue is that uh, the mechanism is very different. It's uh, the argument is that the, uh, the, uh, this warm water and the mid depth of warm water penetrate down into the, uh, the uh, sea ice shelf region and into the base rock so that is melting from the below over the land. So that's uh, the mechanism is a little different, but I, uh, if it works for the, uh, uh, a glacier, you know, it should work for the uh, sea ice as well. And then this uh, idea is not new at all. And, and this, there has been a lot of uh, paper numerical model studies and observation arguing that this, uh, this persistent intrusion of the um, circumpolar deep water into the Amazon, I'm not Amazon, uh, Amazon Sea uh, was uh, responsible for the, uh, this increase of the sea ice, uh, the melting uh, under the uh, Pine Island uh, Glacier Ice Shelf. Is it the annual mean temperatures? Do you have the temperatures? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I should, I should have read it more carefully. Uh, yeah, I got, I got, I got to take a look. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the average of a bunch of uh, things. I gotta, yeah, Something like that. probably summer, probably because yeah, it's difficult to measure during the during the winter time. Probably, probably mostly summer. Yeah. So, so to address how the ocean dynamics could might play a role in the sea ice extension, sea ice variability there. So, I used the surface forced ocean uh, sea ice couple model. So. I don't have to explain it because I have used it for uh, for many uh, earlier studies. So the model, but uh, but the only difference that I like to make is that I'm using this kind of analysis for research and application, which is called shortly called MERA, which is NASA uh, atmospheric reanalysis product uh, for the uh, 1979. Uh, flux from this products to be very uh, very good because I run many different with uh, ERA interim NCEP 2 20th century analysis uh, and then NCEP 2 and 20th century show me very bad results so, and the only in the MERA and the ERA interim can be very uh, accurate it's more close to the observation in terms of CIS variation so I, I decided to use MERA Okay, so, so I'm going to talk about my uh, control, uh, model control simulation. So this is, again, I'm showing you the linear trend during the 1979 to 2014 for the warm season. And this is observation, and this is the model. So you see there's you see some similarity here and there. Some, some places model completely fail. For instance, here of the uh, Beringas and C, and then uh, I'm a, I'm a you see this uh, the reduction of these over here, which is somewhat uh, simulated. And over the Weddell Sea, that increase, you see that. 
And for the uh, cold season, there's an increase in sea ice over here. The model that. So there's a decrease. The model captured that, but it was too much. And then over the Indian Ocean side, uh, there is an uh, increase in sea ice and also for the summer a little bit. But if you look at this side, over the Western Pacific, of the Rose Sea, it's a model is not very good at all. Especially uh, this whole increase here. Um, model captured a little bit, but what about this? So there's something uh, very wrong about this model uh, that is showing a lot of melting over here. So, uh, so anyway, so that's what uh, so you see that uh, the, the Antarctic sea ice trend are kind of really coherent in this region, this regions for different seasons, and also Indian and like that. So what I like to do is I like to average uh, in terms for for each longitude. So I'm going to average for all the longitude. I'm going to just look at, uh, look at the the variable uh, model for the uh, as a function of uh, latitude. So this is uh, so. I have an East Pacific sector, so that's Amundsen and Bering Yassin. I have a Weddell Sea sector, or I'll call the Atlantic Ocean as well, and this Indian Ocean sector, West Pacific sector. So my presentation today is mainly about that. I'll show you a little bit about things as well. I think. So this one, so I'm showing the model result in this format. So let me explain what this what this is. So this is for the Amazon, uh, the Amundsen and Bering Sea, the average for longitude, right? So there is not a function of longitude or average, right? And then, uh, so this is function of And this is a linear trend. What I'm showing you here is a linear trend of CIH fraction for each calendar month, January all the way to December. So you can see that the uh, and also this one, 90 and 10, that is a climatological position of the 90% of the sea ice fraction. So over here, during the cold season, for this latitude, it's a fully sea ice. So I'm going to call this area no core of sea ice. This one, this region from 10% of sea ice to 90% sea ice, I'm going to call this outer edge of this. So most of the uh, analysis that I'm going to show you will be focusing on this. Of course, here is just a question. No, no CIs whatsoever. Like that. So, so okay. So, so you, this uh, melting of uh, the ice during the warm time, during the uh, during the warm season over here, and uh, increasing the sea ice over here. And that's the corresponding picture from the observation. So, you see some uh, similarity, but uh, one is on that melting. This uh, the increase in sea ice is kind of overestimated there. Okay. This is. Oh, yeah, 90%. 90% of this. Oh, that's a uh, sea ice uh, for this uh, control. Uh, this uh, the color. So this this is 30% uh, of the sea ice fractions. Uh, for this period, 1979 to 2014, and then uh, this is like 30%, 20% decrease in yeah, temperature. Linear, linear over the yeah. So yeah. So for hope for so how much how much of sea ice fraction have changed from 1979 to 14? Yeah, that's another another. Uh, index that uh, people are starting to look at it, but this is just yeah. It doesn't tell. It doesn't say anything about how deep it is. Yes. It, it's not right. a measure of ice volume. Or no. Ice mass. No. It's just the ice area. Yeah. Yeah. Just That's two dimensional. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if it's ice thickness, the previous, I mean, my understanding was that was expanded, but then thinner. So yeah. Yeah, actually, there are, there are many. I, I saw some papers about that that part, the thinning and then uh, ice fraction. It's a, it's a kind of different 
index and uh, if you look at the volume and thickness and you show different trends yeah there are some that uh, yeah that's uh, something that I have to also take a look all right so let's just uh, yeah I'm kind of almost done so <laughs> so so first let's take a look at the expansion of the east, east east Pacific okay so this is again the same thing I'm showing you this but now I'm just averaging the whole thing for the winter, for the whole season, June to November. Like that. And then slide, the one slide afterward, I'm going to do the December to uh, May, that average thing. So it's, that's what I'm showing in the next slide. So here is the linear trend of sea ice fraction from the model and from the observation. This is overestimated like that. So. Now this is the uh, ocean temperature trend, temperature, ocean temperature trend as a function of, of latitude and uh, as a depth average over the um, Amundsen and Bering Gassen Sea or whole sea, AJ, SON. Yeah. So, and then this line, black line, is climatological temperature. And this is, this color is a trend. So for this slide, We'll look at this. I know that this is the very striking. I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. Just look at this one. Okay, so the optimal temperature, let's say, like a, a north of about 80 south, decreased a lot in the cold season during the last 30, 36 years or so. And this is consistent with the increase of the ice fraction in the outer edge over here. Consistent with the ice expansion. So, so I think that suggests the cooler a portion was one that actually drove this uh, sea ice increase in the cold season. If you, if you, let's just let's just think about the, um, this opposite scenario that this sea ice change is affecting the ocean temperature. Let's just imagine that possibility. Then the, remember that this is uh, this is cold season. This is a winter. So the increase in the sea ice fraction over over the uh, over this region, over this region, this is the Arctic Antarctic. This the atmosphere is very cold, minus. 40. So if you cover it in the winter time with the sea ice, it will be the area that is contact with the with the atmosphere will be much, much smaller, right? So you will have to warm it up, so because it, it will block the cooling in the atmosphere. So we're supposed to see warming trend, but we don't see it. So what it means is that it is not driven by the ice changes. It is, it is more, more possible that this uh, open temperature change is what that one that driving the sea ice uh, increase there. Okay, so that's it. And then let's talk about the summer retreat in the East uh, Ocean. So here, now we can take a so this is uh, this, this a red one. So the most striking feature in the temperature trend is basically the large warming of the Mocha layer south of 60, 68 degrees south. So there are a lot of things to explain here. Okay, this is warm season, uh, DJF uh, to, the, to the main. So you see that, uh, I'm going to show you in the, in the next slide, but this is due to dwelling. And then you may be a little bit confused. The opelling should cool it, cool the surface water. But why is it warming? So uh, because this region, south of say like a 60 degree, 68 degrees south, there's a thermal inversion. So the temperature here our base is cooler than the temperature below, and that is because the uh, uh, the surface there is exposed to a lot of melting from the Antarctica and also very cold temperature there. So it is combination of the cold and very fresh water that make this uh, thermal inversion possible. So that in, in terms of climatology, is cold here, is warm there. So what it means is that if there is a, a, the mechanism to pull the water above, that should actually warm this region, not cool it. So that's the idea, and then uh, so the so the hypothesis that I have here is that this increased availing uh, in this region make this thermocline upper thermocline 
very warmer you know than than before than than the climatology and for this short period of the austral, austral fall nam that's when after the peak of the warming uh, in the summer it start to cool in the surface and that, that cooling combined with the uh, wind mixing that will actually spur this mix layer and entrain some of this warm water to the surface and that will mix it and that will eventually slow down or drop the seasonal formation of the sea ice. So that's the uh, main hypothesis of this uh, melting of sea ice. So that's ocean driven, this is due to the availing. Okay, then the question is why does the ocean temperature affect the sea ice differently in warm and cold season? Because if you look at it, you see the warm thing of the cold season and then warm season all the time, and you see this cold temperature, warm season, and cold season and like that. But why do they work differently? Uh, for this one, the cold one, the cold temperature in the warm season, uh, that's a simple answer because here, uh, of course, in the cold season, there's no sea ice over here. But in the warm season, over here, there's no sea ice because the actual temperature is too really warm. It doesn't really sustain the sea ice. So it really is cold, but it doesn't really have any impact on the sea ice. But for the cold season, why it doesn't really affect the ice of the uh, winter time over here, that's, uh, that's really interesting because over this cold season, this, this area is entirely covered by the sea ice. So it's the inner core is on 100% sea ice. So absolutely detached from the ocean underlying is absolutely detached from the, the cold and uh, uh, the atmosphere. So, so in order to have this upper thermocline layer entrained to this, to upper uh, ocean, you need a wind mixing, but it's completely covered by the ice. So there's nothing going on. So uh, that you cannot really use that to melt the sea ice. So it doesn't really work that way in the cold season. Yep, so that's uh, that thing. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, and then uh, let's just explain. So the question is, what drove this warm temperature and cold temperature? This one I kind of give you a hint that is of that, so I will talk about it a little later, but what about this one? You know, so let's just think about that. What, what is driving the uh, temperature changes there? So this is a little complicated, so it requires an explanation. So this is the same thing. The fraction increasing, uh, the color here increasing fraction, decreasing uh, sea ice fraction like that. On top of that, what I put here is the, sea, the nest, nest subface heat flux trend. Um, so heat flux trend. So you see that, uh, so positive downwards. Here, when we have a, a more sea ice on the winter, uh, there is a heat flux is increasing into the ocean, and the only uh, uh, like that. So let's talk about it. But, but I put this line here. So this climatologically, this is a small window of warming going on over the Antarctic Sea. Over this entire period, is cool all the time. So here, so yeah, it's a little complicated. But uh, yeah, okay. So what what happened is this. So, so that uh, what I think is this. So during this uh, winter time, there's a lot of cooling going on over the ocean. Now the there the sea ice has increased, right? And then sea ice has increased, so that sea ice is covering uh, the sea ice area during the cold season more, so that the upper ocean is insulated from the cooling. So that should lead to warming, right? Um, so that's what it is. So it, this is the response of the uh, response. This flux response to the increasing sea ice, not the other way around. It is not the one that causing the cold temperature. Because how can it be? Because it's warming there. So it does not explain the heat flux. Does not really explain the temperature changes there. Same thing here. Over this uh, Austral Fall, the cooling there, in the climatological sense, cooling there. Now there is a sea ice has melted a lot, so ocean is more exposed to the uh, atmosphere with the cooling. And then, obviously, there has to be more cooling, right? So that's why it's all negative there. That should cool down 
but there is a temperature a little bit warmer, right? So that the dissipation idea does not really answer why the temperature over here is cold, being cooler and being uh, warmer. So heat flux is not the answer. So what I think is that so I think this is a is a winded ocean dynamic plays a very important role here. So what I'm plotting here is the uh, northward velocity average from uh, surface to 100 meter from the model. So this all color all shows northward trend of the uh, this uh, the velocity. So sign is like that. I I just put this blue color to show this cooling. So that and that is correct. That, that is uh, it, it matches very well with this uh, increase in the southern hemisphere westerlies, which is contoured here. So this tau x, tau x, tau x, uh, except this is a small region here. There's a reduction. Otherwise, all most of the time, the increase in the northward transport of cold Antarctic water pull up to the equal. So I think that that's what is creating this cooling here. Because if you think about this this region, the temperature gradient is very high over this region. So a little bit of multiple transport will have a very big impact on the cooling over this region because the temperature gradient is very 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 high there. So that's kind of a, a, my uh, hypothesis. And then let's take a look at what happened in the, um, what what so what caused the warming. Uh, in the, um, no, no, what, what caused the, uh, yeah, I forgot. Anyway, this is the, uh, so this is the uh, vertical velocity at 100 meter. So this, uh, this color here, so there is oveling, like I told you earlier, there's oveling all the time. And then what I'm showing you here in this control line is a wind stress curve, this negative wind stress curve is correspond very well with this uh, increased wind uh, oveling here. So it looks like it is wind stress curl and the wind incre increase in the southern hemisphere westerly and also the wind stress curl was actually responsible for enhanced welling and the northward uh, enhanced welling of the warm water toward the surface and also the northward transport of the cold and air uh, the water to, uh, to the equator work like that and then that is all to the increase in the southern hemisphere uh, westerlies. Yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. That was. Then, uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to just, just. I want to just read through this main conclusion here. So our model analysis suggests that the wind motion dynamics did play a critical role in the summer retreat and winter expansion of the Antarctic sea ice over the Amundsen and Bering Sea, and the enhanced oveling, enhanced ekman oveling of the warm thermocon layer water. And the subsequent uh, vertical uh, mixing caused the uh, summer retreat, and also increased northward Ekman transport of the cold Antarctic water caused the winter expansion of the sea ice there. So that's uh, basically it. And, uh, I'm done. and then uh, I'm, I can show you just a little bit right there this is for the Weddell Sea, and uh, this is a, it's completely different, completely opposite. Instead of melting and then, uh, you know uh, uh, increase, you see the completely opposite. A trend, and then that uh, the uh, the observation and model uh, matches. And for the East Antarctic, the Indian Ocean is forming or increasing everywhere. So these two regions, uh, working with my collaborator to come up with a hypothesis and testing and things like that. All right, thank you very much, and I'll put it a uh, discussion right here, and then I'll get the question. Thank you. Thank you. So some key. All right, I'm I'm gonna try and conceptualize my understanding here. Uh, if we think about the sea ice uh, a, a, as a not as a trend, but as mm -hmm. as a balance between processes that you described mm -hmm. that would tend to dissipate. Guys, mm -hmm. seasonally, uh, and the flux of sea ice cut the ocean, comes down from the land of glaciers, pushes out 
more ice shelf, the ice shelf expands, and then the ice shelf calves into right. floating ice mm -hmm. uh, that gets off. Right. So you've got these two processes, and if uh, there, there has to be balance, mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. Can you describe the processes of less melt for example, mm -hmm. of the floating ice. Mm -hmm. That's a process. But then you also have uh, the contribution, positive or negative, of landed ice into the ocean. Yeah, that's a, that's a little problem because this model, and I think it's true for most of the Earth system model at this point. I could be wrong. I'm not really expert in the uh, Earth system model. In a, but uh, my understanding is it doesn't have that kind of thing. The, the land sea ice dumping into the ocean, we don't have that in this model. And then... Um, I don't have, we don't have it, and then uh, glacier melting, and then that should definitely increase, uh, decrease the, uh, the the salinity and everything, and then uh, that will actually affect the sea level and everything. We don't have it in this yeah. thing, so that's why actually that's one thing that I I got to put that in. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. my understanding is that West Antarctica is losing ice, the landed ice, rounded ice being lost from uh, West Antarctica. Yeah, 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 but the, yeah, that's, yeah, I think probably it's there in the, in a couple model, but, but for in, the, in the setting that I have and in the sea ice and ocean couple model, it, it, it has to be boundary condition. I have to actually put that in, prescribe it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a, one future work that I have to have. That will definitely influence uh, the result as well. Yeah. Yeah, Eric. You showed a few places where there were good correspondences uh, between the model and the observation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some were less good. Mm -hmm. Does that core, and then you also sort of implicate wind driven dynamics as a major factor in the change? Have you looked at the difference in the winds in the model and the observations um, and looked at the area where it's a poor agreement, did that correspond to poor agreement with the wind? Yeah, this is I, I this is the surface forced uh, the simulation. So the the forcing the wind that I'm putting here is from the Mera. That's uh, kind of one of the best uh, real analysis product, which we kind of consider it as observation. So uh, it should be very similar, but only difference between the Mera components and the model output is that the, this model actually calculates the flux. Uh, by itself, so that the, the model actually derived derived derive the 10, 10 meter wind from the Mera, and then then uh, use the bulk formula to uh, to calculate the wind distress. So uh, there could be some differences there, but in but uh, yeah, that's something that I should check. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah. great time. Um, this is not a very well thought out question, but I'd like to fade in with. Yeah. Um, I'm Wondering if these mechanisms were in place and what changed, you know, and when before 1970, you know, before you started these time periods where you're looking at the trend, where did you start to see the change started to start that begin this mechanism? Oh yeah, good question. I haven't looked at that. <laughs> I haven't looked at that, but uh, that one, one, one thing I can tell you is that I did all this I did using EOF analysis. So instead of having using the just a linear trend. I performed the UF analysis, and the, actually the first UF actually represents the special pattern, the linear trend, very well. But it has a very large internal fluctuation that has to do a lot has to do with the ENSO teleconnection and then the SAM and all that. So there's a lot of internal components there. And uh, for the winter time, that's more so. Uh, the, it's, it's more of an internal oscillation than the trend. But summer is really trend. It's just trend. Uh, Sandy, uh, nice talk, interesting idea. The thing I have a problem with is your point forward action. In all of your computations, you're using the wedge. So you have to have advection across the boundaries of the area you examined. You didn't show us any advection term. Uh, where is that warm water coming from in the 100 to 200 meter layer? Is it being advected there? I mean, I like your comment that you need to look at the mm -hmm. current. 
But I mean, that area has got to be very dynamically interesting. It's got to, you know, you got a yeah. circumpolar. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, basically, so the Ekman transport is is doing that. And you write that the below the Ekman layer has to be eddy compensation. So it is due to the, not geostropy, it's just eddy activity will actually have to compensate the flow over here. So there has to be something that is balancing here. So I don't know if this is that or this is that. I, I don't know very much about it, but uh, the, the people are saying that uh, there's a, uh, the second polar deep water, which is about like this is second polar deep water here, this here, to a degree. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that's that's. So I kind of average the amount, but uh, you're right that uh, some some places a little deeper, some places here. Like yeah, there's a lot of uh, variability within within this thing. So and then uh, so there's uh, for the other part that the people are talking about this uh, second polar deep water is coming toward it. I'm not really sure if this is links to that or not. But what I see here is just boiling. Just a vertical thing, but I'm not really sure how this is. But uh, I didn't show you for the weather. Weather C is completely different. Weather C is like opposite, not opposite, but it just warm over here. Whole thing just warmed up and cold here. Well, that makes sense, Saki, because the, the circle return to the boundary that is on the opposite side. Right, right. So it's a yeah. Little different, but uh, so but uh, it seems like for the LC, it's like this Ekman dynamic doesn't seem to work. There is something else there. I'm working on it. Yeah. Following up on Frank's question, uh, the one LC is very important for the information. Uh, what is the, the billing out of our atoms to see? Are they do they play a role in the intermediate deep water formation? The the what LC? is important, we know, yeah. for intermediate deep water mm -hmm. formation. Mm -hmm. uh, what role does a Bellinghauser and Atkinson play in this? Oh man, you're asking a question that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's important because it yeah. is, you know, with LC we know that sea ice or lack thereof is extremely important in the formation processes and connection with the deep ocean. Yeah. I just don't know uh, about the specific cycle. Yeah, as uh, as far as I know, deep water formation is in the Antarctica is mostly in the Weddell Sea, and then Ross Sea is also. Yeah, this maybe not very much, but the deep water from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the southern ocean, I wonder if that would increase the snowfall and it somehow play a role in, in the different areas in build up of the ice or or not, or even in the mixing in the southern ocean. You have this layer. Of yeah. Water yeah. Is increasing. So I, I bet. Uh, so salinity may be a good. Uh, yeah, salinity is one thing I I didn't I didn't look at it. Yeah, the salinity is one. Because, for instance, like I said, uh, like I response to David, there's no the glacier is melting, dumping into the in the ocean in this uh, case. So I just relax the salinity with the climatology uh, rather strongly. So salinity is a big issue. Yeah, that's something I do to to figure it out. And but what it really means is uh, if we know that West Antarctica is shedding ice uh, faster now. Mm -hmm. Then the the process that you're talking about uh, ought to be even greater than you described them. Yeah. Since they've got to get rid of more ice. Yeah. Right. All right. So if you have any other questions, stick around. Thank you very much.
Oh yeah. Yeah. You can you can you can you? Uh, I think we should do that. Yeah. Stop the. 